And so I sort of think of putting these interviews online as a way to help others see that they're not alone in their experience. But you wanted to talk to me, so I'm going to shut up and, and listen, <laughs> listen to your questions and see if I can answer them. Well, I, I, need, I needed to make a connection with someone who I knew would understand. Okay. So I have a, an in-depth <clears throat> background in Christianity, a master's degree and uh, so forth. And I've been reading Jung in my own way since about 1985. Mm -hmm. we, I think we kind of have a common language. Okay, uh, are, uh, are you saying your, your master's degree was in a theological topic? Yes, well, and in Christian spirituality, the degree in Christian spirituality uh, involves uh, teach a pre-practicum in spiritual direction, a practicum, and a post-practicum. Okay. It also includes Bible study, prayer, uh, just a number of different topics. So when you're done, you've got some theological background, but you've got this practicum right. where you sit with people. <clears throat> right. Yeah. So. Um, interesting. I, I was just listening to Paul Vanderklay <laughs> talking to someone who's Jewish on a on a YouTube just a moment ago. But anyway, go ahead. Yeah. When I was studying uh, some of St. Therese of Lisieux's uh, work, I ran across a quote that she used to give the novices when they were in a difficult mess. And she says, sit, on, sit with that good man Job on the dunghill waiting for the good God. So that's where I am. I'm sitting on the dunghill with that good man Job. I do have a counselor, I do have a doctor, I do have a supportive and loving family. In fact, I'm at my daughter's house right now, recovering from kind of a breakdown. Mm -hmm. And uh, from my Christian perspective, I've always seen these moments as uh, a gift for transformation. Ignatius of Loyola said all is gift and I have to ask God you know show me how this is a gift but I always know that God is with me and that I will be transformed in the process whenever I get to a place where I can't cope I know I'm being taken to a larger sphere and uh, it doesn't come without a great deal of pain and I've been accompanied a lot by St. John of the Cross, who uh, believed that suffering, if you can bear it, if you have the grace to bear it, makes uh, more room for God. So I've taken my sufferings. Okay, um, you're, you're experiencing something that's very common um, among Christians, especially 20th and 21st century Christians. And I think that Dr. Jung at least pointed to the answer. I'm, I'm not entirely sure he got it or that he understood where the bridge had to be built. But let me ask you this. Um, when you think of God, where do you think God is? That's hard to put because God is, is a full statement in itself. Yes. So I can say things about God, but where God is, he's certainly with me. And um, uh, I experience him within. Okay. And, and what about the devil? The devil doesn't have a real... Uh, place in my life because uh, one of the scriptures says Christ came to defeat the works of the devil so my trust is that if that impacts me 
I have recourse to Christ. Okay, well, that's certainly true. I think it might help if I give you a short dissertation on what God, what Dr. Jung found, okay, because from my perspective, he found where God lives. He found the living God, number one. He found where God lives and how he goes about doing the business of the Godhead. And he did that because, you know, I'm convinced that, you know, he had a, a serious complex about his father because his father was a, a Swiss Reformed pastor who had lost his faith. And so he, he went back to basically the beginnings of human consciousness and the evolution of consciousness. And what he did was, as a psychiatrist, he evaluated the history of the human species. And in the course of that, he did many things. Um, but I want to, first of all, share with you a diagram uh, that was done by Dr. Edward Edinger. And did you ever read Ion, the book Ion? I tried. No. Okay. I, and, you know, I, I had problems reading it also, so I, I can certainly sympathize. I'm just going to show you a diagram that <clears throat> Dr. Edinger included in his book called The Ion Lectures. And because he did a number of um, lectures for psychotherapists mainly, or Jungian analysts maybe, but maybe also just generally psychotherapists, but it was also open to the public. And those lectures were compiled into this book called The Ion Lectures. And what Dr. Edinger pointed out that is first of all the structure of the psyche from a Jungian point of view. And so in this image, you're seeing this image on your screen, I presume. Yes. Okay. So in this image, we have the ego. Uh, and there are three examples of the ego here, a woman's ego, a man's ego, and a neutral ego. And behind our ego is the shadow. Now, the shadow is not necessarily all bad things. It's merely uh, an inferior side of our psyche. And so one of the things that we need to understand is that our psyche works based on opposites. Um, and psychic energy comes from the tension between the opposites. And are you familiar with the Myers-Briggs type indicator? Yes. Okay. So in the in the Myers-Briggs type in, indicator, I'm uh, INTP. So that means that my, my dominant function is introverted and my inferior function is extroverted. And so that means that the extroverted side of me is in my shadow, in Dr. Jung's way of thinking about this. And then on the next level, um, there's sensing and intuition. And so my easy way of explaining that is a sensing person uh, sees a thousand trees and won't believe there's a forest. A, an intuitive person sees three trees and they assume there's a forest. And so in my case, I'm I test on the 99th percentile on the intuitive end of the scale. So that means that in my shadow, in my inferior function, are all physical facts in the world, pretty much. Okay, in other words, you can tell me a few words and I'll make an assumption about what it is you're talking about, what you need to talk about, etc. And 
whereas somebody that's on the opposite end of the scale would need a zillion facts before they would believe we were talking about the same thing, right? And typically women are more intuitive than men, uh, but it just happens that I'm way out there. <clears throat> and so for me, uh, everything sense, every sensed object in life is on my inferior side. And so if I explain something to you, um, I don't know what you don't get <laughs> because I get it all, <laughs> right? I understand everything. And when I'm explaining it, or I explain, I understand everything from my point of view. <clears throat> and so I don't know what you're missing to get to the same point I am. I'm blind to that. So that's in my shadow. And, and uh, then is the thinking and feeling. So most men are thinking people, which means they're very logic, rational, or oriented, whereas, or traditionally, okay, traditionally it was head versus heart. So traditionally men are more thinking and women are more feeling. Um, but the reality is over the last uh, 50 years or so, men and women have been testing about in the middle on that. And I'm a little bit out on the thinking side, but not that much. And I definitely have an inferior feeling function. <clears throat> um, so, for example, if I go to a, to a um, museum, I don't usually burst out in tears. But one time when I was looking, believe it or not, at a Jackson Pollock drip painting, I just sobbed. And I had no idea why, okay, and I didn't know for 20 years. So then there's this uh, final one, which is judging and perceiving. And so I'm a perceiving person. My wife, our only difference is that she's judging and I'm perceiving. So that means when we go to the grocery store, she makes a list and checks it off as she goes up and down the aisles, but I go to the grocery store and uh, I uh, just take things off the shelf. So I know the types of things I want and I go to that area of the store and I find what I want and I, and I don't have a list typically, although I do use a list that my wife makes now because it's on my cell phone. But, <laughs> but, but um, you know, in general, I don't need those things. So those things are in the shadow. Also, bad acts are in the shadow, but I'm going to leave that aside for a moment. But that's, um, that's the difference between good and evil. Okay. And so I'm going to leave out a discussion about anima and animus and how that's kind of a lens that we look at, at our self with. Um, for the moment, because it's not really relevant to this issue you've raised. But in the, in the deepest part of the psyche, there is an archetype, and it's the deepest archetype in the psyche, and it's the religion-making archetype, which Dr. Jung and Dr. Edward Edinger called the God image. Okay, but it's also called the self. So in this uh, diagram, it is the self. Okay, and what Dr. Jung was very careful about, but which is an issue that I now have to take up with Dr. Vanderclay, is that Dr. Jung never wanted to challenge theologians because his father was one, I presume, and and he knew that he would stir up a hornet's nest if he uh, challenged theologians. So what he would say is, I'm a scientist, and as a scientist, these are psychic facts that I can demonstrate from my clinical experience, which includes this archetype of the self, which is at the deepest level of the unconscious. I am not going to say anything about the metaphysical God, which is the topic of theology. However, he said one very telling thing. Human beings cannot tell the difference 
between the God image and the metaphysical God. Okay, and so he he never made any direct comment about the metaphysical God, but he said that a human being can't tell the difference. So this is the deepest archetype within us, and um, and so it it is the location of anything that we call God, okay? And the issue that's come up over the last 500 years because of the scientific method, uh, can I take that off the screen now? You basically, yes. okay. Yeah, I've uh, seen it before. Okay, so, um, so the point is that um, the religion making function is part of us. And since the 500 years of the scientific method, the so-called enlightenment, which actually isn't enlightenment at all, <laughs> okay, <laughs> uh, they thought they were getting rid of superstition, but actually um, they, have, they never understood what superstition was, and as a result, um, they couldn't, you know, they never got rid of religion. And, uh, you know, we see that in the Soviet Union where God was written out of the system for 70 years. And then as soon as the Soviet Union fell, all the cathedrals were rebuilt, <laughs> right? And so, um, so the point is that the scientific method has proven that God is not up there and Satan is not down there, okay? Both these guys are right here in us. And, and, so, and so that doesn't mean that they're not real, okay? So the fundamental problem that Paul Vanderclay was having on his video just now, and which theologians don't appreciate, is that they've been selling magic for 2,000 years, okay? They've been selling ideas in the physical world that seem magical. But these are all psychic facts. These are not physical facts. And so the point is that, um, well, Dr. Young says explicitly in, in answer to Job, and paragraph 752, that every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche. It's not a statement of the physical world. It's not a, it's not a statement of the physis. And so all the controversy that we've had uh, with religion since forever um, is a controversy about whether it's it's a, um, it's a physical fact or not. And so uh, fundamentalists want to make us believe that these are all physical facts, that, that the Bible is physically true. And yet they're not, because if they were physically true, they would be in the textbooks of, of uh, natural science, which they're not. Um, and so, uh, you know, things like, well, Dr. Jung was specifically referring to uh, the assumption of the Virgin Mary into heaven, which was a papal bull of Pius XII from 1950, in which the Pope, after 1950 years, finally acknowledges that there can be a feminine uh, feature in the royal, in the holy court, in, in God's court. Okay, so, so there's the Trinity and the Virgin Mary are there. But these are psychic facts. They're not physical facts. And so there's no place out in the world, you know, we're not going to send the Falcon 9 rocket anywhere and find uh, the Virgin Mary because the Virgin Mary is, is uh, in the I'm heart of Christians. You. Pardon? I'm losing you. Oh, it, it says my internet connection is unstable. 
Oh, that's not good. Um, okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm good. Okay, so uh, anyway, you'll be able to review this because I'm making a recording of it. So you'll be able to listen to it again, okay? But the point is that, that all religious statements are psychic facts. They're not physical facts. And so that means that religious statements about evil and the devil are also psychic facts. And uh, so it also means that, um, what well, just means that every assertion made by the Bible that seems to be magic um, isn't magic at all, it was, it, but it's a psychic fact in somebody's mind, and a quarter of the world's population accepts it as true. Now, uh, and that's true of all religions. It's not only Christianity. It applies to all the Abrahamic religions. It applies to Buddhism, Shintoism, um, Hinduism, what have you, Jainism, all of them. Okay, and so all of, and they're all pointing at the same thing. Okay, and this is what Dr. Jung points out. He penetrated to the source of all religions, which is this deepest archetype in the unconscious. And he could prove that as a psychic fact in his clinic. Now, the issue is, part of the issue is that the scientific method wants to solve for X. So it wants to hold all variables constant and solve for X. But the problem is that religious facts are the variables, okay? They're in the arrow side of the psyche. And so when we talk about the logos and the word, as in the book of John, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Well, for early Iron Age men, you know, that was enough, okay, and it, it was enough to build civilization based on that, and they could believe, you know, for 1500 years, but then in 1500, Galileo started to look through his telescope, Copernicus had pre prefigured him by about 20 years, and then all kinds of other scientific facts came true, and they were all proving that this myth or that myth or whatever myth um, is, is not true in the physical world, okay? And so that started to create a problem for Christianity, which Nietzsche stated in Thus Spake Zarathustra, in which he said, God is dead. And by then, at the end of the 19th century, most people had lost their sort of magical belief in God per se. You know, it doesn't mean that religion was bad, it still was a community and so on. And the, the rules that religion had developed were all good, but there was started to be a problem with belief. And so Edinger talks about three periods of human evolution. The first period being at the time of Abraham and Moses, when Moses came off the, off the mount um, and promulgated the Ten Commandments. And so the Ten Commandments were the law. And so this was a period of the law. Um, and Jews went along with that for a very long time. And there started to be an issue about the time of, of Job, because Job started to have a bunch of problems, and, but he never lost his faith. Okay, he never lost his faith. And that's why the book of Job is in the Bible. And what Job did was he appealed to God's good side. He, he recognized that God had both a good and an evil side. And 
he appealed to God's good side, and he never lost his faith in that. Um, and so then Christ came along, and what emerged from Christ and Christianity was that God was all good and evil was written out. So the Catholic Church promulgated a um, promulgated a doctrine called privatio boni and summum bonum, which meant um, the God is the sum of all good and um, evil is merely the privation of good. Okay, well the problem with that is that it would suggest that Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin simply didn't get enough mother's milk and obviously that's not the case. Um, and so Jung's point was that that and this is actually in the Bible, so you can refer to it in the Bible. Uh, you look at First um, John four one. Okay, first the first letter of John. It's in the back of the Bible, four one. And the teaching in that verse is uh, examine the spirits. And the point is that you have two streams of let's call it ideation or, or spirits coming through your psyche all the time. One of them is on the good side and one of them is on the evil side. And from a psychological point of view, <clears throat> if you've built up enough strong ego, then you in your conscious mind can decide for the good. and and you know accentuate the positive eliminate the negative and <clears throat> but it's just as real in terms of of what's coming up from your unconscious uh, it's a spirit coming up from your unconscious which it's just as real as the good side and so uh, you have issues like okay uh, if you go back so there was a time of the law which was the Ten Commandments, then a time of belief when <clears throat> people were able to believe in these miracle things that supposedly happened in ancient times but are not happening now. And now we have to move human consciousness to a next level of, of consciousness which is a level of um, psychological individuation, a, a period of psychology, where we understand these things, which doesn't mean that we throw out religion, not at all, <clears throat> because the point about Dr. Jung's dictum here in answer to Job is that every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche, and that means that they're all true, uh, and they're all true for someone, and uh, we can't deny that fact. Those are psychic facts. And the problem that Paul Vanderclay and other theologians are having is they can't get off the physical material f idea of the world to understand that the psyche has a role too. And so if you look at the picture of me right now, Everything that you can see in this picture, every single thing, is the result of the logos, okay? And men tend to be more rational, logos-oriented, and so every product um, is the result of a very rational process where engineering went in and in the material world we created it. We don't create anything that's intentionally evil we don't create anything that's intentionally bad because it won't be bought and so everything that you can see and everything that you can see in your room with the exception of potted plants is the result of the importance of the logos which had to be true 100 percent now when boeing built the 737 8 and 9 max there was a flaw 
and that caused at least two plane crashes so far and um, and that has to be corrected before anybody's going to trust that airplane ever again and so that was at imperfection in the logos however everything that you can see in this image including me because I was once a glint in my father's eye um, everything came from the irrational side everything came from uh, imagination because before we could have the logos create these things through engineering we had to have ideas and those came from the psyche they didn't come from the physical world the idea may have been suggested by something in the physical world like a later model of an automobile um, is certainly based to some extent on previous automobiles but whatever's new and whatever's purchased now in society um, is the result of imagination and creativity and this is this is where the flaw is in the way religions are thinking and talking about themselves because they're not acknowledging the psyche side of the of our consciousness or our, our unconscious also so again everything that you can see in this image was based on somebody imagining it first and so that's true about all religious statements too uh, although for the most part those religious statements stayed in the psyche part they emerge they manifest in the physical world in things like Notre Dame and any church any any pastor you know he's manifesting something that's from the psyche uh, and you know that's logos but there had to be an irrational side too that's the point and so what we have to understand is that there there is evil in the world and evil is based on these two streams that are coming up out of our unconscious and we as adult mature human beings have to have a strong enough ego so that we can decide for the good okay now let me explain why um, why the period of the law fell apart okay uh, in part we can take thou shalt not kill if you follow that dictum uh, precisely then you can no longer go to the grocery store because everything that's for sale in the grocery store is a um, was once living Every, all the foodstuffs there were once living whether they're vegetables or animal and there's a Buddhist dictum that says all life lives on other life okay and so um, it, if you take thou shalt not kill literally then you can no longer eat okay but obviously we uh, make adjustments for that based on our perception of what we can and cannot eat um, but and so you have vegetarians who won't eat animals or I had a friend who would wouldn't eat anything that ever had a face um, but that's a person who never heard a tomato scream okay but on the other hand if if you take um, if you take the alchemist point of view the alchemists were looking for the spirit in all um, inanimate objects and they found lots of spirit in inanimate objects and actually over a 1700 year period they developed the science of chemistry but additionally if we take um, we we all have been pushing the spirit has been pushing us toward consciousness we don't know where that's taking us but 
something that's uh, peas and carrots, let's say, okay, that's alive, but it doesn't have consciousness yet. By us eating that item, it has a chance to become conscious, okay, if you think of it that way, because yeah. the spirit is taking it toward consciousness by becoming part of us. Um, and we don't know where the spirit is taking us, okay? That, you know, maybe the theologians can give us an idea, but we don't know where it is taking us. So that's a fairly long dissertation. I better shut up and ask you whether any of that is connected with you since you're... Well, uh, it's, I, I think what is, has gotten through in a different way for me is that uh, those impulses that are uh, life, life decreasing are coming up from this shadow or the, anyway, it's coming up from the deep unconscious. Mm -hmm. And with the, the uh, ego has to be strong enough to say, no, right. we're not going to do that. We're not going to commit suicide. We're not going to eat chocolate because it makes us sick. We're not going. So uh, seeing those impulses towards something that would be life denying would be seen as evil. Is that what you're saying? Right. And, and all of civilization is on the good side. So everything that you see and everything you see in life, let's say most things anyway, are good. Okay. Because and the things that are bad, we as human beings smash them out of the system one way or another. And um, the good things emerge. And so, for example, a cathedral uh, would emerge over a hundred year period and it would take three generations. But it was all those people that were working on that cathedral um, all saw that as good and beautiful and wanting to manifest properly. You don't see anything in a cathedral that people didn't think was good, and you don't see anything behind me that somebody didn't think is good, okay? <laughs> and and the impulse that created you and me was, we can also presume, was good, right? <laughs> because evil gets driven out of the system. And, and so I often, I went around the world for about 15 years asking everybody I met, and I I visited 12 Muslim countries. I was in Saudi Arabia 23 times. And um, pretty much everyone I ever encountered, I asked, what is the one characteristic uh, about the United States that makes our country the strongest in the world and the most financially able in the world? And I thought about that question for a very long time. And ultimately, I came to the conclusion that it is our diversity. Because every time, first of all, the United States, we have Americans from every race, religion, ethnic background, nationality in the world. Okay, there are Americans from every uh, group in the world. And every time a good idea comes up from anyone of any of those uh, backgrounds, we adopt it. And when bad ideas emerge, we crush them out of the system, ultimately. Okay, it takes time. And so you have to think of, um, of Gandhi's statement from the movie in which Ben Kingsley is playing Gandhi, and he's in the middle of a fast and he's, he's very close to dying. This British woman, Miraben, who is close to him, comes up to him and offers him water. And he says, When I despair, I think of the fact that throughout history there have been tyrants. And for a time they have seen, seemed very strong. But in the end, they always fall 
think of it always okay and this is the nature of the human species that we recognize the difference between right and wrong as a in a broad way we recognize the difference between good and evil and good always dominates and and wins and you can look around the world and see the countries that have um, have tyrants who insist on you think this way and no other way uh, it's my way or the highway those countries have fallen behind and and they're very much behind and you take a place like Saudi Arabia where the women have been denied access to uh, basically jobs and being respected and so basically they've written off half of the brain power of their country uh, they're slowly starting to loosen up on that now but the reality is that it's going to take a very long time for women to be able to make their contribution to you know the Saudi economy and to public life in Saudi Arabia and as long as that's happening uh, they're going to be behind and so the reality is that we as human beings in the broadest sense uh, know the difference between right and wrong we recognize the difference between good and evil at at broad in broad brushes and what it seems to me the religions need to do is to reorient their thinking toward this unconscious fact okay and the fact that uh, the divine is in the psyche and it's and it's not something that we have to prove that you know we can go somewhere and there'll be a God on the mountain on a big throne or something like that that's not what religion is um, interference yeah and and God is not a puppeteer he's not he, he could care less about our individual lives. He, um, you know, when, when you see a football player cross the goal line and he points up be, and says, you know, God made that happen. Uh, well, yes, that's right, but it's not a God up there. It's a God in here because the self, his self, forced him to go to the gym the number of times it was necessary to have the physical conditioning and be coached adequately to know what the rules are so that he could make that touchdown and that's a very strong force that's that's the force that's in charge in our lives dr jung would call that god you know and and so in star wars when they say may the force be with you that's really what they're talking about, okay? Uh, is is if that the e if the ego if the ego is not strong enough to choose the good? Well, then, uh, how does the ego get stronger? The ego gets stronger by making mistakes. Okay, uh, <laughs> we have to no really we have to think about what Dr. Jung and Dr. Edinger t called. Uh, the the job archetype and it's it's a process uh, that we have to go through many times in our lives and that process produces a strong ego uh, the process is contest defeat now if you have a contest and you're not defeated then you keep going and you rise to a different level but if you're defeated okay that's when you have to go back and lament and then you have to be reborn okay and so it's a natural process that takes place it starts right from the time that your uh, mother is toilet training you because you know you're going along thinking you're a little king or queen as an as a baby who's a wild animal and it's all instinct and you have to be taught to use a toilet and so your mother does whatever she does to persuade you to use the toilet and and so 
you know, at first you think of God, of mommy as a goddess, right? <laughs> and you yourself as a god or a little king or queen, and then all of a sudden you find out that your goddess uh, punishes you in some way, and that's a defeat. And then you lament about that, you think about it, and depending on how long it takes to toilet train you, you're lamenting during that period, but ultimately you're reborn into a child that now uses the toilet properly. Okay, so your ego gets a little bit stronger because you know that if you do things in that way, you can get along with your mom, but if you don't do them that way, uh, you're going to be in trouble with your mother. And, and it goes on through life. Every time you're defeated, you lament about the defeat, and then you're, you get reborn into something else. And these things get bigger and bigger. So in my case, I was a Marine Corps officer. I was a lieutenant colonel. I wanted to keep going in the Marine Corps until I was a general. But one fine day on January the 4th, 1990, I slipped on the ice on a parking lot at, on Marine Corps Base Quantico and broke my leg. And that was the last thing I did in uniform. That was Dr. Young's God telling me that's not the direction for your life, okay, in, in effect. And so it's, that was a defeat. It took six months to repair my leg and it was very painful for 28 years and then a year and a half ago I had to have my ankle replaced because of that event but that was a defeat I had to lament about it and then I had how to long did you lament I mean that can go on for quite some time I would assume. well I mean some people who have a defeat like that never recover very honestly and but in my case it certainly wasn't the only thing in my life and it also happened that right at that time uh, I had bought a copy of Man and His Symbols which is Dr. Jung's work for laymen and over the following year 1990 I read that book to my wife as we were going to sleep every night for a year okay I read three or four pages a night and at the end of it I felt like I had had a year of psychotherapy but that was also a part of my lamentation to try to understand myself and what I wanted to do you know then you know I went I went on and, and did other things and I, I founded a company um, in late March of that year 1990 after I could get around and drive my car I founded a company which 15 years later we took public and so that was the direction that my life had to go at that time but I've had many other defeats bigger and bigger ones <laughs> and, uh, but but the point is that each time I had a defeat like that, my ego got stronger and I had another direction that was presented to me. So when you're saying now that you're, you're stopped, what I can tell you is that your unconscious has, has a future for you, okay? And it may, it may relate to your uh, master's degree. I don't know. Since you mentioned it at the beginning of this conversation, it might be that. And it might be having to do with Christian spirituality because uh, what Dr. Jung believed and I believe is that uh, if we understand religion in a more sensible modern way, then religion is valuable to us. And what Dr. Jung said is that, you know, we can't throw out religion. And in fact, uh, religions, all the great religions are grand schemes of psychotherapy. So before there was psychotherapy, there was religion. And they all evolved naturally. Um, and they all evolved at about the same time, interestingly, within 
within 500 years plus or minus uh, they started to evolve and um, and so but early Iron Age men didn't know what was going on when they had a vision or a big dream uh, they didn't un necessarily understand that they thought it was Geppetto <laughs> sending them <laughs> a dream whereas it was uh, the God image in their own psyche that was trying to communicate with them and and telling them something all the dreams and visions that you find in the Bible and when you go back and look at the Bible you'll find that virtually all the all the uh, miracles of the Bible are dreams and visions uh, for example the Annunciation uh, with the Virgin Mary was a dream that she had and Joseph had a dream that was very similar that said that she was impregnated by God well those dreams were certainly miracles because even today in that part of the world an unwed mother uh, would very very possibly be stoned to death in some countries of that part of the world even today and and so the fact that she wasn't stoned when she was 13 years old or whatever it was and uh, she was pregnant the fact that her betrothed Joseph uh, went along with her was a miracle okay <laughs> that's sure surely a miracle and um, but that miracle was based on two dreams you know in the physical world was the Virgin Mary physically a virgin uh, yeah that's a little bit too hard to swallow but if if you accept that the God image or God was communicating with both Mary and Joseph at that time to present that story it certainly is a miracle that it was accepted uh, that she was impregnated by God and therefore that Jesus Christ was born that is a psychic fact okay and if you if you think about it in that way it's possible for modern ways of thinking about the world to accept it okay as as opposed to you know a lot of atheists or agnostics will say ah no that's not possible but if you understand it as a psychic fact not a physical fact right then it works okay and and then it doesn't have to be magic per se okay then it, it's it's something that happened that did create a definite miracle okay a definite miracle of her not being stoned okay yeah. <laughs> and therefore her son being born okay that that was a miracle 2,000 years ago assuredly right. and so if you understand that religious statement and Dr. Jung said every religious statement of whatever kind is a statement of the psyche if you understand it as a statement of the psyche right. then it's okay right. okay and okay. and so the point is that nothing in the physical world is everything in the physical world is a statement of the psyche but it's built by the logos okay? <laughs> right and and so we've written off the psyche but the psyche is every bit as important as the logos so-called okay right. so well thank you uh this has been really helpful i think uh given me a couple of things i i can use as tools and uh insight um i know you have to go